Thank you so much for the introduction. I assume everybody can hear me okay, I hope. Uh, before we begin with anything, I'd like to take a moment of silence, please, for the now close to 700 people who have been slaughtered in Gaza. Perhaps the word slaughtered seems a bit jarring to people in this room, but I would uh, venture to guess that after this latest escapade of the IDF in the occupied territories of Palestine, that the cat is finally out of the bag, and that here in the United States we are witnessing for the first time in my lifetime an opportunity to finally push not only for a corridor of humanitarian assistance to Palestine, not only for an end to the siege, but for an end to the occupation. And today, I hope to begin by giving you a brief update on what's happening, of course, on the humanitarian issue. Uh, it's very difficult to ascertain the latest, but uh, I've taken some time, it's the reason I was late today, uh, to gather some facts and figures for you. And then I'd like to talk to you about what we've been doing at UPA, and to let you know, to assure you, that although many of us in this room are waiting for the siege to end, and we have been made to believe that nothing can be done until that has happened, that there is actually much that can be done right now by everybody in this room, should you choose to do it. I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing at UPA, and then we will begin to think about the strategy of what comes next, not only in terms of the humanitarian issues that need to be addressed, which will be enormous, and on a scale we have never witnessed before in Palestine, once the shooting stops, but also to think about a strategy for finally and ultimately ending the occupation. So let's begin with the latest from the ground. Um, as, as I'm sure you know, at this point we're talking about uh, fatalities upwards of 640 people. 40 plus of whom were massacred in a UN school just yesterday, in a school that was clearly marked, uh, the GPS coordinates of which were given to the IDF. And to this day, to this moment, we are hearing excuses and rationale for the mortaring and the shelling of the school with innocent families, civilians, and children in it. We're hearing that 30% of the fatalities at this point were women and children. And as many of you in this room may know as well, there has been some dispute as to where that figure comes from, whether or not you count policemen who were murdered on the first day of the strikes as civilians, or you count them as Hamas fighters. That's an open question, remains to be seen, but I would urge you to take that figure, the 30%, with a grain of salt. We're hearing now of 2,800 people injured. 2,800 people, 45% of whom everyone acknowledges are women and children. In addition to that, we know now that at least 11 ambulances, 11 medical uh, uh, supply and, and relief vehicles have been bombed or have been damaged by what is being called collateral damage of uh, Israeli bombings. And I should say as a side note that uh, three of those were mobile clinics of the Union of Healthcare Committees, which is an organization based in Nablus, and you may know somewhere. Uh, and those mobile clinics were actually funded by UPA. So it uh, raises serious questions for us as a charity as to what we are doing in Palestine and what our proper role should be, something we'll get to at the end. In terms of the aid that is able to get into Gaza, we have heard uh, that as of yesterday, 50 truckloads were able to get in through the Karim Shalom crossing, which is the only crossing that is available now for uh, direct assistance. The other crossing being, of course, Nahal Az, which is uh, taking fuel, industrial fuel in particular. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. In addition to that, there were about 41.5, 41 and a half truckloads were, that were able to get in on the 5th of January. And just to put this into perspective, one of the things that uh, we have been trying to ascertain is when you talk about a truckload, particularly of food, what exactly are you talking about? And of course, it depends on the, uh, the, contain the, the contents of that truckload. But if you're talking about something as simple as rice, for example, um, the estimation that I've received, and perhaps you could add some to this, actually, when I talked to Bill over at Anira, what we're hearing is uh, basically enough food to feed 100 families for three days. And I would urge you, again, to try to validate that on your own. But uh, this is uh, what we're hearing from our folks at the UN and from some of our colleagues who work at the other organizations here in town, including ANERA, 
which is doing fantastic work, of course. A hundred families for three days. And we're talking now about a population, 1.5 million people, 70 to 80 percent of whom, depending on who you believe, are initially, originally refugees from the creation of the State of Israel. 80 percent of whom depend on food assistance to survive before the attacks began. And 80 percent of whom live below the poverty line, as it is defined in Palestine. So to say that 50 truckloads of food got into Gaza is essentially to say that you're giving less than the drop in the bucket, the proverbial drop in the bucket of helping people. And this, of course, does not factor into, uh, into the equation the issue of all of the injured, the wounded, the dead, and the mourning that exist in Gaza today. The Nahal Oz pipeline, just to give you a, a brief update on that as well, we're hearing that on 6 January, which of course was yesterday, was completely closed. And this is, again, for industrial fuel. The industrial fuel, which not only powers the generation plants that give electricity, but also powers the gener uh, uh, provides the fuel that powers the generators that allows physicians, surgeons, and hospitals to continue to treat the wounded. We're hearing reports now that at the largest hospital in Gaza, which of course is Al-Shifa, they have all of two days' worth of industrial fuel left to perform all of the uh, much-needed medical attention that they have to perform at this point. There is no sign that Nahal Oz, by the way, was open today, although we haven't heard final word of that. If anyone in this room knows better, I would urge you to speak up. Rafa which is uh, an entirely different issue that I, I don't, uh, I'm not inclined to get into today because of the, the politics of where Egypt stands on all of this. I can tell you just as a matter of fact that 10 truckloads of medical supplies were allowed into Gaza yesterday and 18 medical cases were evacuated. The Kearney conveyor belt, which is the only uh, crossing point into Gaza that allows wheat grain, which of course is what allows the bakeries to continue to make bread, which is the absolute minimum that people who are going hungry need in order to not be hungry, was completely closed yesterday. And it has remained closed throughout these attacks, and there's no sign of it opening. Only nine bakeries, as a result, remain open in Gaza. This is nine bakeries out of an estimated 53 that we know of. And those bakeries are, have not received any flour since December 27th and the beginning of the attacks. Prices of this bread, as a direct result, have doubled in most areas of the Gaza Strip. And even if people were able to afford it, they don't have the cash to be able to pay for the bread. And let's pause here for just a moment, because as Summer mentioned, uh, before I started working at UPA, I worked for the World Bank. And we worked on... Uh, access to finance, which is a, a, another sort of World Bankish way of saying microfinance. It's a way of giving poor people access to credit, to savings, to various financial services to be able to lift themselves up out of poverty. And I have never, in all of my time, either with the World Bank or USA, USAID, heard of a situation where people are unable to buy bread simply because they do not have the physical pieces of paper, the shekels that come from the Central Bank of Israel at their disposal. Even if someone were to find work, and there are upwards of 100,000 people who do participate in a food for work program by way of UNRWA, they are not able to actually get the physical paper and the coins to be able to go out on the market and buy things. It is unprecedented what we were seeing in Gaza today. There are shortages of cooking gas, of course, because of the, the inability to get anything into Gaza today. Uh, whether it be industrial fuel or gas of that nature, and therefore households which have access to dry goods, rice in the case of what we were talking about before, are unable to cook it. And even if cooking gas were able to get in to Gaza, and we've heard uh, the same story when it comes to food and medications, the UN and UNRWA in particular is reporting extreme difficulty not only getting it at the crossing point, but being able to distribute it to people who need it the most, particularly in the north of Gaza.